Welcome everyone and thank you all for coming to our uh, Artificial Stupidity panel discussion hosted in tandem by Surim Generale and Enigma. Uh, I'm Nicholas, a second year CSAI student and I will be the host this evening. As much as I would like to listen to these amazing speakers talk for hours on end about the topics we have at hand, it's my unfortunate job to stop them from doing exactly that. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to say a quick word about Studium Generale and Enigma. Studium Generale organizes all kinds of extracurricular activities, like this one, on relevant and pertinent topics, such as symposiums, lectures, debates, often in cooperation with study associations like ours. The Studium Generale graciously helped make this event a reality, uh, which, by the way, you can also receive a Studium Generale certificate for attending if you're a student. Uh, by attending five events, including this one. So if you're more interested in that, you can put it on your CV. Uh, just Google Studium Generale Certificate Tilburg. Uh, so they graciously helped us make this event a reality uh, with my fellow Enigma members. Uh, Enigma is the newly created study association for CSAI, and we're looking forward to providing you with many more events like this one. Now, onto the event itself. We will have a first discussion round followed by a 10 minute break at around 5 p.m. and then a second discussion round. And finally, if we have time, a rapid fire round, uh, followed by drinks at the cafe. So you've hopefully all received cards. Uh, so I'll explain how these work. We have green for agree, uh, red for disagree, blue for remark, and pink for question. Uh, I very much encourage you, all of you, at any point during the discussion, if you have a question, if you have a remark, if the speaker says something interesting and you'd like to participate, uh, just raise your, heart, raise your card. My friend Dennis here will come to you with the microphone so he can get picked up by the recording. He will ask the question for you uh, so you can address us directly through it. Now, I'd like to introduce our four talented speakers. Uh, first, we have Frank Bosman, who is a researcher for the Department of Practical Theology and Religious Studies, and teaches various courses for the Tilburg School of Catholic Theology. During this discussion, Frank will draw from his expertise of theology, faith, and video games by presenting games which use AI as anthropological mirrors. Sitting next to him, we have Pim Haslager, who is a professor of societal implications of artificial intelligence at the Department of AI and the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior at Radboud University in Nijmegen. In his research, he investigates implications of deploying AI in neuroscience, raising the question of how to ensure the responsible use of new technology. Now, from the Department of Cognitive Science and Artificial Intelligence, we have Afra Alishahi. Her main research interests are developing computational models for studying the process of human language acquisition, the emergence of linguistic structure in grounded models of language learning, and developing tools and techniques for analyzing linguistic representations in neural models of language. And last but not least, we have Joshua Ekblad, who is the lecturer and director of the iconic hub for entrepreneurship research and education Tilburg at the Tilburg University Management Department. As a former high-tech entrepreneur, he gained experience raising venture capital and building strategic relationships with established high-tech firms. So please, a warm round of applause for our speakers for coming here tonight. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to get to why exactly are we here? Well, you often hear the praises of artificial intelligence and how it's the future. But what about artificial stupidity? We're here to open a conversation about how preparing for the future should not be careless and how artificial intelligence, if misused, could be dangerous. So starting today's discussion, we want to talk about an example that brings to light the dangers of glorifying AI and how artificial intelligence could become stupid through us. In 2016, Microsoft released the chatbot Tay, a story some of you will be familiar with. The AI was a natural language processing program that was designed to reply and talk to people based on other people's interactions with itself, uh, on Twitter actually. And only after 16 hours of launching, Tay was shut down. During its short-lived life, it became a racist, fascist, and inflammatory bot. As you can see by the quote, for example, do you support genocide? It replied, I do indeed. <laughs> now, this is one of the tamer quotes by Tay. We hesitated to put anything worse, but it said much worse things. 
Today is an example of how releasing an artificial intelligence that is not sufficiently ready for a task can have drastic consequences. Furthermore, it comments on how the interaction between the public or user base and an AI can cause a good idea or a good AI to become artificially stupid, assuming, of course, that the data the AI was given is one of the reasons why it had to be shut down. It comments on how the interaction between the public or user base and an AI can cause a good idea to become a bad idea. And you can actually see a quote from Tate themselves when asked uh, or when told you are a stupid machine, it replied, well, I learned from the best. And if you don't understand that, let me spell it out for you. I learned from you and you are dumb too. Uh, I would like to note that this is a problem of intentional tampering. Tay was actually not automatically driven towards inflammatory or racist behaviors, but uh, when the internet got hold of how Tay was programmed, they decided let's have fun with it and make it as racist, uh, homophobic, misogynistic as possible. They talked to it as, uh, in as bad language as they could because they realized it would learn from their behavior. So with that, I would like to get to the first question to our speakers, which would be, since it was the mishandling of the users that led Tay to become such an inflammatory bot, do you think that it is necessary to limit or control the interaction between AIs and the public? So would you like to start this off, Frank? Yes. First of all, this, this Twitter account reminds me a bit of uh, that of, of Trump, so maybe Trump is also using artificial intelligence, but we have to look. <laughs> um, so I would say that um, um, I think it's 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 important to to um, educate as much as possible. So keeping things from the public um, is always a bit difficult. Eh? Uh, People are not up to it. We have to keep it quiet. We don't have to publish this. It's the people are not ready for this. Is something that rather a dictator would say than someone who has benevolent intentions. So I think we should not keep anything from the public. But as a university, we have a task in that um, to educate people as much as possible and make people understand how these things function, uh, how these things work, and then we have can have a discussion about it. So hiding something, I think, is never. A good, a good idea. Right. Would you say then, uh, before you can release it to the public, do you have to very much understand how it operates? Do you think Microsoft was partially at fault for not predicting that the users ah. or the internet would react in such a way? Well, I think you know, there are three possibilities who are at, to blame here. So you could say the public, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, program itself, or Microsoft. But I say the second option is not valid. I think an artificial intelligence is not a moral agent, not have, does not have moral agency and can therefore not be morally responsible, cannot take the blame. Um, and I think in this case it is a combination of Microsoft maybe not realizing enough how these things could be so easily man being uh, manipulated. And at the other hand, of course, the trolls on the internet having a good day of course. and just being trolls and trying to make fun of everything. So I think it's a shared responsibility in this case. All right. And on that note, actually, I would like to ask Pim, uh, in terms of moral agency, it could be argued that only humans are able to have responsibility, right? An AI isn't a moral agent. It can't make such decisions, so it shouldn't be held accountable. Uh, what do you think? Do you think Microsoft or the users are solemnly at fault? Yeah, the, the, I, the, the thing with, with computers is you cannot punish them. Uh, so, so that's a, a really big problem from an ethical perspective or from a responsibility perspective. You know, you can destroy a computer or a robot and it cares as much about being destroyed as my refrigerator cares about it, which is absolutely nothing. Right. So, so that's what I think, yes. Uh, Would you like to counter on that? There is, of course, um, you know, always the question like, how do you know when you get into solipsism and the other minds problem? If you want, we can go there. Uh, but in essence, like a thermostat, you know, and a computer are basically processing information, but they're not grasping it. They don't understand it. And without understanding what the information is about, it will be humans that remain responsible. And the big challenge for us, of course, is how can we maintain that responsibility while dealing with systems that sometimes outsmart us? That's a very paradoxical situation that we created. We have smarter systems than us, and at the same time, they don't know what it is about. Chess computers beat the world champion, but they don't know why winning is more pleasant than losing. 
both, you know, we, we just program it anyway, and I have a chess computer program that I put in moron mode, and then I, I beat it all the time, and the computer doesn't care. It cares as much as about winning. And so we somehow have to deal with the machines that we created, or that we let learning uh, take place, and then how are we going to do that? That's the big societal challenge, I think. So would you say that no matter how intelligent we make these agents, they would never be capable of, for example, having their own decisions, their own responsibility. They, they're kind of simulations of... Never is a dangerous word. So uh, I don't believe in the soul. I think humans... Ah, oh, yeah, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think humans, you know, all our behavior, all our cognition should be explainable ultimately in terms of physical particles that operate according to physical laws. Uh, so sooner or later, we will be able to understand how we understand, how we feel, etc. But I, I simply observe that currently, whereas in the, the dimension of intelligence, we have an enormous progress, but in the dimension of sentience, we're still at zero. And there's no progress also which is fascinating in a way too. Eh? It tells us something about what we find interesting or not, and we are very fascinated by our own intelligence. So we reproduce that and we understand that better and better. But what we share with animals, sentience, feeling, we actually don't study so successfully and we're not really capable of understanding where that comes from or how we should model that, which might be a good thing too. Eh? By the time machines start feeling, I get scared. <laughs> Uh, I would actually like to ask if, actually, uh, f Frank, from the perspective of a theologian, right, do you think humans have a soul uh, or is there something intrinsic in the material? Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Sheryl's Chinese Room experiment, yep. uh, which essentially says that no matter how advanced an artificial intelligence is, uh, it is only replicating instructions that it's told to do it. So the deterministic program, you give it input, it gives you output, but it never learns in, in the metaphor itself, you tell it how to translate Chinese through symbol manipulation, but it never knows Chinese, it never knows what it's saying, you just feed it English and it gives out Chinese. So would you agree with Cheryl in that, in that state that you need some more material so to give rise to sentients, or is, for example, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated enough our intelligence enough to give rise to sentients? Well, I think that the discussion of the soul is a very difficult discussion, so I will just place it very gently here, so we just leave it there. But from a theological perspective, I think it's very interesting to see that artificial intelligence and robots in our everyday cultural life, in our books, in the games, in the series, in the films, in the novels that we read, you see that artificial intelligence and robots are used as an anthropological mirror, like in the medieval times, in medieval philosophy, the angels were used as a anthropological thought experiment. So what we what we think about robots and what we think about artificial intelligence is, well, more often yes than no, it's, it's a reflection of what it is to be a human being yourself. So for example, if we think about, we want to recreate something that is resembling us, like an imago dei, we, res we, res we resemble something that is very close to us, and then we say, well, um, but it does not have any moral agency. Aha, uh -huh. so we think about ourselves as one of the defining characteristics of a human being is that it is capable of, of, of well, having we... a moral responsibility and, and therefore right. free choice and things like that. So I would agree with Cheryl in the Chinese room experiments that a computer can very much simulate sen sentience or can very much simulate a con polite conversation from the Turing test or can simulate uh, um, uh, having a conversation like the right, take computer, but it's only a simulation. It's just it's just reproducing uh, what it has been told to reproduce, but mm -hmm. it's not it's not reflecting upon its own existence. Or you should say, well, what we experience as reflecting on our own existence is also a simulation. Right. But then you go down the rabbit hole and you end in simulation theory, which is also very interesting. Yeah, because you can never prove that the person you're talking to right now is also conscious. And that's exactly the solipsistic rabbit hole that you go down there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and actually, if you think about Tay, for example, even though the content of their tweets was very wrong, they're actually very convincing. They would probably pass a Turing test, right? Yes. If you showed their tweets, you wouldn't recognize that it's not a person tweeting them unless you were told that it's a bot. So, uh, actually, that's a question I'd like to pose to, to Afra, which is uh, assuming that Tate did its job perfectly, right? 
uh, since it is actually very convincing when it tweets. And the stupid part was from whoever released it or the users, for example. Uh, can an AI ever be stupid? Or is the stupidity of just how it's handled? Because the, if you think about it, Tay, for example, did exactly as it was programmed to do, it, right? Um, so actually, uh, the uh, danger of aging myself badly, uh, <laughs> I want to um, compare these you know, more shiny, recent, seemingly very advanced systems with what was common for us to play with as bachelor's, master's students in the 80s, which was, uh, you probably have heard of ELISA or at least some of the people on this <coughs> panel. So there was this rule-based system, which was basically a psychologist, right? So you would chat with it and you would uh, talk about your problems and it would say, tell me about your mother. And then you would say things about your mother. And so it would say, tell me more. I get that you are, and it was a completely keyboard-based uh, keyword based system. I don't know what your definition of stupidity is, but with uh, comparing with modern machine learning systems, this was a very stupid system. But you really had to work hard to break it, as in, you know, you, I, I know that some people actually started confiding to Eliza. It really sounded uh, convincing. Um, stupidity from a machine learning point of view has definitions, right? So you have evaluation metrics. You are going to evaluate the system based on cases that the system has seen before and trained on cases that the system hasn't seen before, to what extent it can generalize, to what, it ca to what extent it basically memorizes. Um, none of these really, I would say, translate very directly with the general opinion of what a stupid being is. And I don't even think that it matters that much. It, it, I mean, going back to your uh, original question, should we release AI to the public? I don't think that this question is well defined enough. Um, what are we trying to protect the public from? If you give uh, Tay as a fun, you know, experiment for people to play with or to interact with or Eliza, as long as you make it clear that this is an artificial system, this is something that doesn't have, doesn't represent the opinions of a, a crowd, as long as Microsoft is willing to admit responsibility for whatever harm that the system does, I personally don't see any problem. But if the Ministry of Health then releases a chat box for teenagers who are you know, having suicidal thoughts and puts it in charge of talking them out of it, um, and then that system does something wrong that actually persuades the, the teenager to actually do the deed, that's where the real danger comes from. Not for, uh, Developing on itself is not an issue. Using it and under what, what condition you are using it is the... Right. Uh, well, you, you could say that we saw that Tay was shut down after only 16 hours, likely because it reflected very badly on Microsoft. Do you think that if everyone understood that Tay is kind of an experiment, that even when it became as horrid as it became, that it could stay up, for yeah, example? I mean, I don't think that Tay said anything that uh, uh, human trolls on Twitter or on other... Uh, yeah, actually, it repeated exactly what they would say, yeah. 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 So, so I don't see why you, you as a you know, policymaker would be worried. The, the same rules apply if you want to control the trolls, if you want to ban you know, racist comments on Twitter or on TikTok or whatever platform is uh, the platform of your choice, you, you apply the same filters to Tay as well as the anonymous... Uh, the rest of the user base. Uh, who, yeah, uh, hi, is hiding behind there. Would you, would you say something like freedom of speech could apply to Tay? Yeah, yeah. I, I personally have no, no issues with that. Fair. I do. Yes, I do. Oh, I'd like to hear your issue of that. No, no, no. Unless, do you have anything to comment on that? Uh, I was just going to say, you know, from an organizational perspective, if we just look at what Microsoft was trying to achieve. So, you know, part of my um, my professional experience is I was a, a tech entrepreneur working with artificial intelligence. We were developing systems like this. So this is a conversational bot. Uh, in our case, we were using natural language processing to extract uh, certain things. But at the end of the day, 
we're running these experiments. Microsoft is running an experiment. Us, as a startup venture, we were running experiments. And you put it out there in the real world and you see how it behaves and how it interacts with, with people, with society. And at the end, um, I think Microsoft learned a great deal. They started with this, it went down, but then they came back with Zoe. And Zoe introduced filters. Right. And then you can get into this idea of free speech or not because the filters themselves are trying to catch these things early on. Eventually that's developed into Cortana. Then they try to compete with Alexa and with Google. So I mean these these are these are products and services that they're that they're working on that they're trying to develop. And they were unsuccessful. I mean Samsung they had a licensing deal with that, but you know, there's a lot of money here at stake. There's a lot of economic value uh, to conversational bots. And you know, there's all kinds of startup ventures, or hundreds of them. And and even just in the Netherlands, there must be at least 50 startups uh, Probably, just started yeah. up in the last few years that are doing this kind of stuff. So the, the potential economic value is there. You need to run these experiments in order to see how they, they perform. Uh, I think Microsoft learned something from it. So there's learning. It's not the kind of learning that we're referring to here in terms of machine learning, but it's it's learning about how to, to deploy these uh, in society. And I, I like it, uh, you know, apart from the kind of economic perspective on it, I, I think it's great that it rendered transparent something that, and this goes to your point, that it already exists in social media that isn't always um, visible because of these sort of walled um, gardens or silos, right? Because in social media, there's even special platforms that are just for certain types of thinking. Um, and so that's even becoming more and more entrenched and more and more um, difficult to to see. And and so this this brought it out. Now, of course, this is an old example. I think it's 2012 or 2013. Uh, 2016, I believe. Okay, 2016. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a long time ago, and um, and we have a lot of uh, other examples to show um, how these entrenched ways of thinking and how certain platforms are are actually vying for that entrenched way of thinking. So, uh, so from an economics course. perspective, it, even though it went down the way it went, you'd say it was still very useful from the point of view of an experiment for Microsoft. Well, it helped them that get to Cortana, which which is something they were trying to um, develop. To well, they they developed it, but they were trying to to generate you know licensing fees from it. Um, so they were really trying to get people to adopt it, uh, certain large brands to adopt it. That didn't really work out, uh, and now the sort of and it discontinued Cortana in terms of a, of an API. Now it's a service that they will use themselves for Microsoft Enterprise offerings. So it goes to a kind of virtual. It'll end up feeding into a virtual assistant type of service, and that's the kind of stuff we were working on too as as a startup. We were building these virtual assistants uh, for enterprise. And there, there's just a, a great deal of economic value to be to be had if you can achieve that. Yeah. But also, what it showed is how difficult that is to achieve. And it's so easy with virtual assistants for the stupidity or the limitations for it to go wrong. Right. And in this case, you know, the the economic stupidity I would say is the fact that the service fell short. So it's not a it's not an existential stupidity here. It's a, it's a very practical stupidity, which is it didn't work. It clearly showed its its shortcomings and failings. And of course, for a service like this to work, you have to convince. And we experienced this firsthand as, as a startup, and I did multiple startups in this area. It's very, very hard to achieve, to pass the sort of, uh, it's not exactly a Turing test, but some kind of test where people are doing these robustness checks, and then it still comes back as performing in a way that you need it to happen in a business uh, context. Right. Uh, any closing remarks before we move on to the next, or do we have any questions from the audience uh, for the speakers? Yeah, Dennis? <laughs> Frank? Frank Pym. They both have great beards. Oh, uh, yeah, for Pym.
what do you propose in terms of the message you send to your so, solidarity about this message in Sweden? Yeah. So just to repeat the question for the recordings, the question is about sentience and how we should go about to measure sentience. So, so uh, let me explain. I don't think we have a good test for that. Uh, what we do have is an argument from analogy. Uh, we are biological systems. We know from our own experience that we feel there is something it is like to be me. I know what a feeling feels like when I have it. Hitting my uh, thumb with a hammer, for instance, very vivid. Mm -hmm. And by analogy, I attribute those states, those experiences, to other biological systems. Uh, in the case of computers, robots, thermostats, refrigerators, uh, there's no such analogy. So I would think that the burden of proof is actually on those who want to make claims about the sentience of, for instance, Lambda. You remember the, 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 the chatbot from uh, Google recently this summer. So. I know there is a problem with the other minds, and you have the argument, solipsism, you know, oh, we've been there many, many times ever since uh, the Turing test and, and the Searle's Ch Chinese room. Mm. But the main thing is we can be generous towards systems that are similar to us, because we can extrapolate from our own experience to others. And in the case of artificial systems that really have a totally different type of, you know, inner structure, um, I think there's good grounds for being extremely skeptical. I want to see the argument. I want people to show me how it is that that system is capable of feeling. I think that that's a fair request. Does that make sense as an answer? Which is also why I think that Thai, for instance, doesn't have human rights. Freedom of speech is a human right, excuse me. You can, of course, say, okay, animals, we should expand this, and there's even debates about rivers these days, you know, as having some sort of rights to facilitate protecting the environment. But a refrigerator, a bridge, Alexa, Thai, and those kind of systems, Pepper, the robot, they don't have rights because there's no capacity to suffer. Hmm. At least that's a position I would like to uh, defend. So, if you could catch, uh, if you catch by speaking to you about this certain view, would you be more convinced than, let's say, Lambda? Well, you know, the thing about saying that you feel certain things, that's very easy. The first program I wrote in the 80s on the Commodore 64 was, hello world, I'm happy to be alive. And the computer printed it. It was not a program to speak of, you know, I've never been good at programming, but okay, I did my fair share a little bit. And of course, it's easy to make a system. Uh, Jerry Fodor, uh, a famous philosopher of cognitive science who no one remembers these days, said, Disney World is not a major scientific achievement. And that's true. So uh, we, we had, uh, I was in the Bournemouth from Boningen with a robot project as part of an exhibition in uh, the museum in Rotterdam. And we only used the, um, the standard live mode that you have on Pepper where it starts following and moving around a little bit. And people fell for it like a ton of bricks. <laughs> they found it extremely interesting, exhilarating, spooky, all kinds sorry. of response. We over attribute. Sorry, if we could just wrap it up because we need to move yeah, to the sorry. I, I, I no sorry. I get excited here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, very interesting discussion. Sorry to wrap it up so quickly, but we are hourly here. So uh, on the next topic, we would like to talk about AI in military applications. Uh, again and again, we're faced with the reality of stupid AI and what does this mean for the implementation of AI technologies with the ability to kill? Now, I'd like to pose a hypothetical, a not so distant future where AIs have a very large involvement in strategy decision-making, and possibly even be the boots on the ground for military operations. I'd like to ask uh, Pim to begin with, actually. Uh, what could artificial stupidity lead to in employing military AI incapable of the ethical and moral codes we humans have? I talk too much, eh? you already noticed, so you <laughs> have to shut me up uh, very quickly. Uh, well, first of all, of course, what we get, what we already have, is a lot of innocent victims. What they call, uh, what's it called again? Collateral, Collateral damage, damage. Yeah. which is a word I really, or phrase I really hate. Um, because systems are too stupid. You know, situation assessment, for instance, is something that is really computationally hard. It's exponential. The number of features that you can distinguish in an environment 
will grow explosively the more fine-grained the distinctions are that you can make. So the better perception, the better reasoning they can do, the bigger the problem space comes, and, and these systems get lost. Also, the sense of relevance is very difficult for machines still. When is something actually relevant? That's a very hard problem to crack. Actually, on that note, I'd like to ask Frank, yes. uh, if I understand correctly, uh, you think disobedience is actually a defining human character? <laughs> Well, I don't think that, but some of the computer, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an expert in mm. video games, and yes, I like to tell that on parties. And um, uh, uh, I, I played the Turing test and the Talos principle, for example, and there are two uh, video games that try to think about what it is that makes us human. And they do that by employing very, very uh, sophisticated artificial intelligence systems, uh, Elohim and uh, Tom. And... Um, both games at the end, that's my interpretation, conclude that what is the defining characteristics of being human and which a robot should have in order to qualify as a human is disobedience. But, uh, and for a computer program that would mean going beyond its program, disobeying its program, going against set rules, making its own rules and things like that. And that's, of course, all, all very hypothetical on, on, on the technology of artificial intelligence we have now. But it's like thinking about what human beings are. And one of the, I think I agree, one of the characteristics that human beings have, we can, we can disobey or we have free will. And with that free will, we can decide to go against the rules or against the current or against obligations or against a government that wants something from us or or our university that wants something from us and then the interesting question is okay do we want robots to be exactly like us if that means that we have to program them or have to allow them that they become not only stupid but also disobedient, disobedient. and i only have to quote the example of the horizon zero dawn game by Guerrilla Games that had an absolutely fantastic thought experiment about how that should end up. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, on that note, I'd like to ask the, the far table. Uh, should we, to some extent, program disobedience into uh, AI systems? For example, if we have uh, an artificial intelligence in the military, should it be able to be disobedient enough that if it recognizes an order is an unethical one, for example, should it be able to disobey a command? <laughs> I uh, really dislike this military domain. I mean, any, any discussion of developing technology specifically for the military uh, application makes me very uneasy. So if you allow me, um, I would switch to... Oh, sorry, if you could hold the microphone closer. <laughs> I will switch to health, right? So if you, because it has similar characteristics. Let's say you have an expert system that is supposed to diagnose cancer. And if it makes mistakes, it can take lives. So there is gonna be collateral damage. There is gonna be, you know, added um, efficiency if you yeah. can do it. Is it better? Yeah, okay. Um, so the question is, to what extent do we allow these automatic systems to actually replace actual experts in these domains where life and death decisions could be made? It doesn't even need to be life and death if, you, if your decision is something along the lines of your own example of like the Dutch tax system or, you know, anything that affects the lives of people in any way. Um, and the, the core of the matter is do we allow these systems to take over and make decisions without involvement from humans? And that's the part that feels wrong, right? I don't think that we can really say, oh, these, these systems are not good enough, so we are going to put them aside. Um, they are very good in certain aspects and certain domains, um, and they really help the, the process move forward faster as additional sources of information, as long as we admit that we cannot trust their judgment 100% and we need human experts to just use them as aids. Um, now, disobedience, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but from an insider's point of view, um, I think that, I, I'm, I'm saying that I'm sorry because I, 
want to say that this exists in many machine learning systems in the form of regularization. I don't know how many people have had any courses in machine learning. The idea is don't trust the data that you have seen 100%, right? There is always room for things you haven't seen before, so leave space for that. And if you actually don't do this regularization on any, or any variation of it, meaning don't leave any space for decisions based on things that you haven't seen yet, then your system is probably not very good at generalizing to new situations or being transferred to new domains or, or placing uh, unseen circumstances. So I, I don't think that uh, when you put catchy names on things, people might react like disobedience is, you know, it causes rebellion and it sounds cool. But in, in reality and in practice, you have to do it for every simple machine learning based system. If you want to use them in situations where the, the system might want to deal with data that it hasn't seen. In order to generalize. In order to be able to generalize. Right? Uh, on that note, I'd like to ask if you think humans should supervise. Uh, you can also address this question. If, humans, if there should always be human supervision to any decisions that an AI algorithm comes with. Uh, do you think there should always be someone above? So let me just take the, an economic perspective on what we were discussing. So I, I won't also talk specifically about the military. Um, of course. Uh, because I don't think there's anything particular about that from an economic perspective. But the, at the end of the idea, this idea of disobedience or this idea even of things like military outcomes, um, they're, they're so, they're, they're value laden for one. And by value laden, I mean they affect or should affect, in my opinion, human being life. And economic activity regards the condition of human life. So when we look at things like disobedience, we can think of, for example, unions and union activity in order to, to better uh, wages for uh, laborers who are trying to improve um, their not just economic conditions, but everything else that we know is correlated with that. So one's education opportunities, one's health outcomes are, are largely um, affected by economic uh, conditions. So when I think of things like disobedience or when I think of things like, um, you know, an example that, that you said, if there's some kind of order in a military context, I think of, of those as people fighting for something of worth that meaningfully affects people and, and the human condition. And of course, there's a lot of AI already in all of that. So we're not just painting a kind of futuristic picture. There's a lot of AI already being used in military right. context. So for example, recently, um, so it was discovered that, so the F-35 is one of these sort of um, fifth generation uh, jets that's super advanced. And it was discovered that there's, and it was discovered using AI actually through the supply chain. So the analysis of, of the supply chain of these incredibly complex products that have tens and tens of thousands of different parts. And then you have to think about each of those parts are themselves manufactured using tens and tens of thousands of other parts and processes which are themselves, right? So it's very hard for, for any kind of uh, human to kind of figure that out. And they were using AI and they discovered that there's a Chinese alloy uh, at the end of all this whole chain that somehow got introduced into making a part that makes another part that makes another part that sort of builds up into this, this jet. And uh, so they looked at it, but you know they they would have been prepared to ground all of those uh, fighter jets based on that. And so when I think about you know not just AI used in that context, but when I think about what that could tell us about AI also in general in a kind of military maybe context, is is siloed uh, forms of AI. So different forms of AI being developed by different parts of the world with very different value systems maybe attached to them. Um, so that's just food for thought, I'd, you know. Wait, do we have two more minutes? Yeah, uh, yeah. 
You could add something. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I fully agree with what uh, Joshua said. Um, again, from a you know technical point of view, I also wanted to emphasize this, that, um, you know, whatever your question is, whatever your application is, you always map it to certain categories of problems, right? So a lot of these problems boil down to classification. Now you train a system that classifies emails into spam and not spam, right? But you can also classify a system that groups uh, people's faces into terrorists and not terrorists, right? So the underlying nature of the problem is the same, but the labels that you assign to these classes have really different ranges of impacts on people's lives, right? Now, this notion of disobedience but it also reminds me of the, a very, very basic um, concept in machine learning, which is basically the confidence of the model in predicting a label, right? right. If you force a model to spit out a label given a, an input set, and it calculates probabilities for these two classes, and one of them is 49 and then the other one is 51. If it's forced to choose the better label, it will spit the one with 51% probability. Right. Um, it would look like it's the same outcome if the probabilities were one and 99. But it is really important to pay attention to and make how much system. information we have and based on what we are making these decisions under which Right. And then I think we have a, a question from the audience. Yeah, can I just speak? Like, can you repeat? Yeah, he'll... yeah uh, it might just be food for thought, but I also have a question about the implementation of such systems. Because, uh, like we brought up before, that situational computation is extremely complex. And I think there is not a single environment that might be more complex for decisions than the war zone, for example. Because I know that, for example, when you take facial recognition for... Uh, predicting uh, criminal behavior, that these systems already produce a lot of false positives, so that a lot of people uh, are suspected for criminal behavior, but the system just decided wrong, because the uh, yeah the the environment in the war zone is super unpredictable and also needs a lot of um, moral agency by the AI system that you use. So I ask myself, like, how would you start even to begin thinking about this because it's a super unpredictable environment for the AI as well. Like how would you start testing out if the system would even work in the first place because the environment is extremely unpredictable and I think that we are still very far away from that if I'm not mistaken. On, on that note, do you think we should have simulations of the environment before? Obviously a simulation always has limitations and by definition a simulation is less complex than the environment but if we make an, a, an agent, let's say for the military, uh, an intelligent system, should it first be put into a simulation of how we think it would operate in the real world and then see how it works? Which is kind of, you're already putting an, an AI into a simulation, so. I was just going to, I think it's, there's no simple answer, obviously, to this. Um, but maybe something to, to think about is this idea of, of consequences. And, um, and if, if, of course, we can, we can say in some ways that AI, you, you could program into it somehow that there are consequences to the AI. It suddenly loses processing power or something. That's its punishment, you know, who knows? But at the end of the day, I don't find that particularly interesting. I think what matters, it's my point of view, but I think what's, what's important is to think about human consequences. I, I, I don't know how we can spend a lot of time thinking about uh, other consequences. I mean, this is the world that we, we live in, we occupy, and, and we have some agency over it. And of course, going to war and the decisions that we make, I think should be our consequences. And if, if you, because the, the situations, the complexity you brought up, they also lead to very imperfect actions by human beings. There's no question about it. It's not just that AI can't cope with that dynamic and that complexity, it's it, people can't either. And they do all kinds of terrible things, and there are terrible outcomes. But then we have these other institutions. We have legal s systems and things like this that are there to handle atrocities that come out of these things. And there's some kind of accountability, and I, I know you're going to get to accountability at some point, but there's, there's some kind of consequence uh, to humans and that, 
you know, that we can really identify with. And that's what's truly important. I, that's just my opinion. That's that's where I'm at. After you know doing AI for almost 20 years myself in applied ways, I basically reached that conclusion. It's not it's not the deepest conclusion to to get at. Perhaps it's not the most sophisticated. But at the end of the day, I just think at the end of the day, we just need to keep the human and and our values at the forefront and and build these systems in, in ways that we understand how they're working as well as the outcomes that we see. And All right. keep that in mind. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone. We're going to have a 10 minute break. So we'll be rejoining at about uh, 5 16, 517, please be on time. But yeah, you're free to go to the bathroom, etc. So to welcome us back, we are starting off with a hypothetical, which is the following. Uh, an AI engineered and sold by a private company, which has replaced the role of a radiologist, misdiagnosed a patient and its mistake led to the death of the patient. The family of said patient sued the hospital, holding them accountable for the fault of the AI. The court rules in favor of the family and sanctions the hospital. Now, I think for Joshua, I'd actually like to begin by asking you if you think it would be wrong to hold the hospital responsible for the misdiagnosis, or what do you think? Well, I, I would say that, again, it would be the certain institutions that are responsible for that in terms of regulation and then just uh, through a series of, of lawsuits, there would be some kind of uh, judgment that emerges. So it's a, it's a social, in the end, it's a social, socially con constructed um, set of, of, of norms that, that will emerge in terms of who will be responsible. But in terms of an economic perspective on it, I'd say, well, a couple of things. One is, of course, the price of that litigation and the price of uncertainty will be factored into these services. So they'll, you know, they're, they're meant in some ways, you know, this particular example has benefits in several ways. One is just to make um, the evaluation, because we know the human evaluation, uh, even for very clear um, set of conditions, it, it wavers a lot. It's, it's very, it can be very unsystematic. So at least by using some kind of AI technology, you can make it systematic. Whether it's correct or not, it at least will be reliable. And of course, you want it to be valid over time. But, but we know that there's lots of studies that, that show that in, in economics that, that look at various types of um, uh, decision making that needs to take place where that reliability is not there. And it could be anything from the time of day to what somebody had for breakfast to whether there's sun outside. I mean, it, you know, we're extremely irrational um, even when we are exercising some very specific task uh, at hand. And so we get these unexpected outcomes. So. There's obviously an advantage to having that, that kind of reliability. Um, and the other is there's possible uh, productivity benefits that can come from it, right? So if it's an AI, it would take less time. Um, and it's something we haven't seen a lot of. Um, so, so again, ec economically, we've seen a lot of advantages in, or gains in productivity in the manufacturing sector, but, but very few so far in the services sector. And in fact, this example you bring up of a, um, uh, you know, you could also, it's, it's some kind of, you know, hospital specialist, it's a kind of specialist in, in, in um, radiology, for example. That, that's one of the fastest growing areas in the labor market. Um, so I'm using the, the U.S. as a context because of the size of that market, but that, that's one of the kinds of roles that is the fastest growing. So it's, it's a labor intensive, and that's not for AI, but that's for hiring people. It's a very labor intensive um, uh, role that's actually increasing and it's very well paid in addition. Um, so there would be potentially some advantages to using this kind of technology um, to, to, to see productivity gains uh, made and of course in terms of health outcomes to improve possible health outcomes. All right. Uh, especially because the AIs could be argued that they have a better margin of error than human doctors, right? Well, there's, there are studies to show that already. Yeah. Right. So we already we already know that that they've already done this for for at least the last ten years, looking at the performance 
of human evaluators in the medical context uh, who have, you know, who are experts, and then these expert systems. So this is a type of expert system that you're that you're um, alluding to here, and um, that these AI systems are much better. Yes, of course. This is totally true, of course, uh, and very important. At the same time, uh, two things. One, we hold technology to different standards than human beings. You know, I require guarantees about a bridge that I wouldn't ask from people that carry me across or something. So we have, as AI people, to learn that simply saying we're better than human beings in terms of uh, less errors is not going to be sufficient. We have to look very critically at the high standards that standard technology, think airplane industry or something, is applied to, and we have to apply that to ourselves. Second, um, human errors are tend to be random, it's like what you said, uh, did you have lunch yet or not, or you know, is it raining outside? One of the big risks of AI is that there is a systematic pattern when the errors occur. And that it's going to be vulnerable people, marginalized groups that will get a larger share of the errors than maybe other people. In part because they're being helped by systems, whereas the, let's say, more rich get helped by people. So that's another thing that we have to be very aware of. So it's not undermining the argument. I totally understand that. And less error is always better. But there are additional quality controls that we're still in the process of developing in AI, I think, that we have to take into account more seriously. Uh, Frank, if you have anything to add, then after. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of, uh, of, of, of the problem of the dilemma. Huh? So uh, I think we're all familiar with the uh, thought experiment of the trolley problem by Philippa Foote and then the, uh, the doctor uh, 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 thought experiment. So you have like five people who if are If you could actually, uh, for the audience, if you Yeah, yeah of course. So you have five, five people who are in desperate need of, of transplant organs, otherwise they will die, and you have one perfectly healthy human being, which happened to have all the organs that you need and they're just uh, compatible with one another. So the question is, can you sacrifice one person for the benefit of five others? And the trolley problem and the doctor problem are just two iterations of the same problem. And, well, these kinds of dilemmas, of course, are very much found, especially, well, in military application, but also in medical application, medical context. And that's also a thing that uh, it's extremely hard to, uh, we, we find it extremely hard to make our own decision, let alone uh, try to learn a, a, a robot to make that kind of decisions for us. Up. So I agree with all of the arguments that were made. Uh, I just wanted to make one extra point that it is dangerous to talk about AI as if it's one entity and humans as if we have just a homogeneous pattern of behavior. There is massive individual difference. If uh, you put an, extra, an experienced cardiologist next to an intern who was trained for three months, the, of course both can make mistakes, but the nature of the, and range of these mistakes are very different from each other. The same argument applies to artificial intelligence and to automatic systems. It really depends on how the system was built, under which conditions it was trained, under which conditions it was tested. So, of course, someone has to take responsibility. Of course, the hospital is responsible. They have to justify why they chose a particular system to replace a radiologist. They have to justify it, and we have all seen, especially during the corona time, that with the health system under extreme pressure, these automated systems can save lives, really. But the cho cho such choices have to be able to, be people who make this uh, uh, decision making have to be able to defend them. Right. Uh, actually, we'll take that question from the audience, Dennis. <laughs> you can just uh, give out the question to us and I'll repeat it. Um, So if I understand the question correctly, it's about holding the company that actually built the AI responsible yeah. instead of the hospital. Just to, to, to 
take that up. Uh, yes, but uh, it's even more complicated because you have, for instance, companies that build neural networks and other companies that provide the data for training. So then where, where does the error come from? And that means, and this is what I said earlier about quality control, we really need in AI, and this is really urgent, uh, a very cohesive set of rules and regulations to determine who is responsible for what. Ideally, I once made a suggestion, for instance, with robots, that they act under human supervision and they keep track themselves a little bit like a black box in an airplane of under whose authority they're currently operating. And so the moment, uh, like in a hospital, you know, someone else would use the system, then the, tr the responsibility transfers to that person. And you can track and trace where exactly uh, the human responsibility resides. Like and in a... Yeah, for instance, but we need to do that in advance. Mm -hmm. So the problem now is that we, we get these kind of cases and law is not really suited yet, not updated enough to, to take care of such questions. And in a way that's irresponsible. Um, so we, we really have to up our game in, this, uh, in that sense. So in terms of accountability, uh, we need to start thinking about these topics now. Yes. Uh, if you'd like to add. And also, you know, this is a specific example of an evaluation exercise. So I think, in, 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 you know, apart from the accountability um, question, there's, there's maybe, as I said before, some efficiency to be had in some kind of evaluation decision-making exercise. But if we're looking at the healthcare sector in general, a service sector, there might also be good reason to have inefficiencies in that. And there might be certain things, it, in, it might be things that we actually value, that we don't necessarily always want efficiency uh, in that system as well. Um, and, 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 you know, that's p part of the reason probably why there hasn't been that much productivity gain in the service sector versus the, the manufacturing sector. So even as these systems get more intelligent, it isn't always necessarily, and, and we can get into sentience as well, but I mean, at the end of the day, there's also, uh, we gain a lot from social interaction and interaction with other human beings. And that's also part of our well-being and something to consider also in the, in the health sector. So you're saying, for example, uh, even if we find that it's more efficient to have an AI uh, take charge of the job of a radiologist, it could still be beneficial to have a doctor because for our own well-being, that type of conversation, for example, talking to the doctor as a person that might make a person healthier, uh, it's good for our well-being. I, I would hope that we have human beings of, uh, of great skill in both uh, their their area of expertise, but also in sort of their um, kind of emotional intelligence involved in the healthcare sector, um, along with AI, which can serve some very kind of rule-based uh, evaluation exercise, where of course it needs the appropriate data uh, to draw from in order to make sure also that it is um, performing equally well for different kinds of people. But that's an issue we already have with the healthcare sector is we already know that much of the research is done only on males, white males uh, of a certain age. And so there's already that issue uh, in, in healthcare and we wouldn't want to exacerbate it, uh, you know, now with AI, but we have to still deal with those fundamental weaknesses we already have, which is we know very little about the physiology of, of of female compared to male and very little in terms of other ethnic groups uh, other than white Caucasians. Do you think that's something that employing expert systems could, uh, that, could that gap be bridged? Uh, if, for example, we're trying to do research into uh, having more data about these groups that are less represented, could AIs help that? Yes, because again, it's, uh, it's like transactional. So if I think of it from, a agent, from an economic agency point of view, which is, once we've decided that's what we want to do, then what are the tools that we can do in order to execute that in an efficient way? And AI certainly allows us to execute what we know we want to achieve in an efficient way. But the decision to, to do that and to, and to deploy the resources that way is, uh, is a human decision. So I think once we make that decision, and it could be that having that technology available helps us make that decision also because the technology changes also our set of options. There's a lot to be said about that, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of decisions, I'd actually like to hear and maybe uh, see a show of cards in the audience. Uh, do you think 
that decisions ultimately should be made by humans, would you be okay with an AI, for example, making a diagnosis? Or should AIs merely provide suggestions for doctors and the doctor is ultimately who makes the decision based on the input? Uh, green would it be, you'd be okay with AIs making such decisions. Uh, red would be, I would prefer to have a doctor at hand that supervises the process. Now, uh, very interesting. Would, uh, would some of you mind? I see very few green cards and mostly red cards. Uh, would some of you mind? Uh, raise your card, your red card again. Wait, sorry. Green cards were the very few. Uh, raise your green card if you're okay with, if you want to say your, your opinion out loud, why you'd be okay with that. Is that. Would that be okay? Yeah, so you can. Okay, so if I understand this correctly, if the AI reaches a certain point where, it's, where it reaches a kind of accuracy that is acceptably good, then it is the expert of that field and the human has no role in it. Well, would, you, would the speakers have a remark on that? Would you still say, even if we can prove that an AI is more accurate in such diagnosis, would you still want the decision to be made by an expert? I do have a remark. I think, again, I, I agree that it really depends on the domain and on the task and how the system has been evaluated. So there are certain uh, domains such as uh, image processing uh, in which we now have automatic systems that are better at detecting certain types of tumors by scales of, you know, by, by degrees of magnitude uh, than human doctors. Um, and so if you test the system enough, then you are sure that it's not biased towards a certain type of ethnicity or age range or, or gender. Um, I really don't see the reason not to trust the systems. Um, however, if you just, you know, automatically just press a button and then send the patient to the uh, operation room, that makes me also feel uneasy. So I think um, the healthcare in general and the decisions about the health are very complex. They're just looking at, you know, certain factual evidences is not enough. Uh, well, of course, yeah. Part of becoming a doctor actually is training how to deal with the patient on a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Briefly add, I mean, um, yes, especially when it's about test results or image analysis, etc. then there are tools, right? There are toolbox. That's something totally different than a doctor that on the basis of all kinds of symptoms and test results based maybe on social understanding of the situation of a person, of a patient, you know, think about stress or those kind of things, making a decision. That would be a totally different kind of thing. And secondly, uh, there's also the principled argument uh, that certain decisions about human beings should only be made by human beings. Like imprisonment, I'm not talking about traffic uh, speeding tickets and stuff like that. I mean, you can automatize that maybe. Uh, but, but serious sentencing, where, where the social circumstances, whether someone has a job or not, or you know, those kind of things, uh, that should be done on principle by human beings because it's about other human beings. You can disagree eh, with all the, but, 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 but at least that's an argument that we need to consider in the debate. Would you say even if you can demonstrate that, for example, let's say you have a judge that's on artificial intelligence, even if we can demonstrate that they make more accurate rulings than human judges, you'd still want a human to make such calls? But I think part of what's being said is that what is accuracy in this yeah. context? Um, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's like, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's why the example of the evaluation exercise of is there a tumor here or not is a little bit easier to, to kind of figure out than than most of our uh, most of what we encounter in social life in our in our society, and imprisonment is one of these things. And, and this, you know, and and social justice also as it relates to the penal system. So it's not just about sentencing; it's also about understanding uh, the conditions that lead to certain types of, of, of crime and uh, and of uh, and of outcomes. And then, of course, there's the need. We have a need to also want people to improve their lives. So we don't just send them to prison um, in order for their lives not to be improved, but there's, you know, in varying degrees depending where, um, 
uh, effort that's made to, to help people actually get their lives back together because they affect other people's lives. Those people who go to prison have families and they also affect lots of other people that are not imprisoned. And that, in the end, affects us all because we're all connected. Of course. Uh, let's take a couple of remarks from the audience. I think there's uh, uh, Mrs. up in the back there. Yeah. So if an AI would be able to start diagnosing things that they can't do today? Yes. What kind of things? I mean, in the medical field, uh, right now, it's, uh, it's impossible to make a fair diagnosis. But maybe if this piece of AI can make an uh, accuracy that is high enough. Uh, to so would this be like di the diagnosis that humans can't do today? Yes. OK. Yeah, but the principled argument remains, right? I mean, it's not just. It's not all just efficiency. Mm. There's social factors. There's there's psychological factors. <laughs> there's empathy. Uh, you know it, it, those kind of it, it, the the idea that you see everything that is relevant to a problem by looking at the efficiency or speaking in the abstract of errors is simplifying the the the, the social reality too much. I would think. So, so even though there will be progress, and again, especially in the more technical applications like detecting tumors, etc., I don't see any problem. But for a lot of the processes, there's an intrinsic social human aspect that you want to preserve. Uh, sorry, sorry, just let me interrupt, Rooker, because we do have a question far back. So if, if I could try and summarize your question, it would be that we hold AIs to the higher standard than we do for the human experts, but the AIs learn from the human experts and they don't make perfect decisions all of the time. May I take this one? Because this is exactly the follow-up that I wanted to make on both on Pim and on Joshua's. I fully agree with your comment. I think it's a very important point to raise that uh, a, the AI, I really don't like to call it. Anyway, uh, this <laughs> machine learning based systems are trained on data that is collected from experts in the field. So they kind of reflect and in many cases emphasize and exaggerate the, the mistakes made by humans. Um, so in response to what Joshua said that these systems can actually help mitigating the bias, this is a, the danger that the, the system itself might actually contain a lot of bias that was imported from human judgment. On the other hand, data is eye-opening in a lot of cases. So even though decision-making in life-changing circumstances should be left to human experts, I think it is important to always have an eye on large-scale data. As an example, this recent meta study came out, which made a lot of uh, noise that there is this very clear systematic pattern that if uh, male cardiologists treat female patients for heart problems, they underdiagnose and female patients die um, with a very noticeable margin of error. But this doesn't happen if the if the patient if the doctor is female. So this is a very clear example of a database observation, which then it doesn't help if you have an expert, which is a human, bringing them in the loop and leaving all the decision-making power to them, uh, having a system that is forced to become less and less biased as a tool might help in these cases. So it's also about complementarity, right? Thank you. It's, it's about complementarity. Was very often we think about AI and humans in terms of replacement which I think in many cases is not the ideal at all. 
and should also not be the aim of AI. It's to complement human expertise with a different kind of expertise, like with the big data, and, and get the best of both worlds. And what we still have to do is, is find the proper balance between those two systems and to check how that then results in human accountability, for instance. We, we don't know exactly how to use the tools that we make appropriately. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, another very big societal challenge. Uh, I'd like to take the question far left over there. You've been holding your hand for a while. Uh, no, over here first, sorry. Oh, there at the edge. Uh, should I just yell it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I am, you know, obviously see a lot of red cards, and I understand about the principle, I'm all for it. Um, but there's a lot of situations where AI is the only option. There's, uh, you know, most places in the world that it isn't a radiologist, and the Dutch healthcare system is also heading that way, unfortunately. So I'd like to ask your opinion about the scarcity situation, because you can say, I only want to be judged by a human, uh, so let me repeat that real quick. Oh, actually, Dennis. Oh, yeah. So thank you for bringing that to light. So the statement is that there are places that don't have the same resources that maybe some of the Western countries do, and that AI is the only solution for them to even have a radiologist. Essentially, AI could fill in the shoes where humans are missing. Uh, in that situation, would it be more okay, for example, to have decisions made by AI systems? So maybe just from an economic perspective, if we think about how this comes into the world, at the end of the day, these solutions will come through startup ventures, through large uh, tech companies who are creating these services. And the way they go about creating these services could, it, it could reflect the things that are being said here. That, that could be the type of, the, the way it's being done with, with humans involved um, could it, it, it can have that ethos built into the algorithm. At some point, I agree with you, at some point there's a good chance that those will be applied to other parts of the world or to even um, any part of the world at specific moments in time when it becomes necessary. And that will be more algorithmic than it is, uh, than it is human. Um, but if we can also work on other things like human capital development and economic development uh, also around the world, then we would also hope that there would be a, a more even distribution also of those capabilities uh, across the world. That's the way I would see it. So I kind of see it as a whole mix of things working together. And it's absolutely uh, essential. We, there's, there's joint action here between machines and humans. Right. Uh, any further remarks from the audience? Let's go with you. Accountability. You can't, yes, accountability, but also we are irrational creatures, humans. And when damage is done, we want justice, we want retribution. And you can't damage, a, you can't punish a machine, so somebody needs to take the responsibility. So the statement is that we need to keep the humans in the loop, so we have somewhere to uh, kind of place the accountability when things go wrong. Yeah, and get a sense of justice. A sense of justice, yeah. Any remarks? Well, I agree. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Fair, yeah. No, no. Green card. Uh, yes? Yeah, Harry. That's the whole reason why I was like, I don't want AI to choose everything. Because... But, but still, I mean, uh, the, the, so translating to the human source of accountability is not going to be easy. Uh, you know, like with the thousands of uh, objects that consists of thousands of parts that were created all over. That's going to be really messy. But of course, one of the nice things about AI is that it's actually quite good in tracking that. So, so what are the applications that we can build for AI to solve this problem that in part arises because of AI? That's the nice, we keep ourselves busy, eh? you don't <laughs> have to worry about. But that I think would be uh, really something to think about constructively, especially in combination with, with legal experts. Uh, I think we'll take a question from the far back. Yeah, start, start with Dina. Go ahead. Okay. I wanted to ask uh, the implementation of uh, close working with industrial technologies. Do you think there is a problem with maybe degrading the responsibility of getting the right of the, of the professional 
and then there again in the link where somebody yeah. questioned AI, even though they are responsible for it. Yeah. So, sorry, if I understood this correctly, the question is that this co-responsibility between the AI and the human, that the responsibility will be lost somewhere? Yeah, because in diagnosis, it's the data to plan to make sure you're right over and over again, because it's where a lot of symptoms can communicate into a lot of different areas, and you're just trying to make sure you're right. So maybe bringing the simulation also during the process. So, so there's this idea of humans on the loop, right? So, so there's a machine uh, that's making the recommendations and the human is on the loop supervising and intervening when things go wrong. Now, if you do that after a while, people start doing other things. Uh, it's very funny. It's like with a self-driving car where you're supposed to have your hands on the wheel and look at the road. Yeah, right. I mean, and that's not because it's a bad person. It's because we're persons and we start doing other things. The more reliable the technology becomes, the more we start doing other things. So they call that phenomenon being under the loop. You're supposed to be on the loop, but you're actually under it. And that is dangerous because that means that, that uh, experts, like in the medical field, will become what they call moral crumple zones, like with cars, you know, they take the hit. They carry the responsibility. But in a way, the system is set up such that they cannot meaningfully, being human, take that responsibility. And that's another issue that I see coming with decision support systems, that we will, you know, trial uh, human beings for not being on the loop, but the whole situation that we created is psychologically unmanageable for them. So I see a big risk here for many professionals, also in law, for example. All right. I think we're going to take one, maybe two more uh, before we move on to the rapid fire round. So uh, you've been holding your hand up for a while. Yeah. Um, just one interesting topic that I also want to bring up when it comes to accountability, because we talked before about the expert problem, so that actually we introduce a human error into the system that then led to this decision. Um, but I'm also thinking about terms where the AI, by its pure computational power, can be go beyond uh, human ability. So there are just certain things that we can't do, that AI can do, with pure computational power. Yeah. Then we ask again, okay, so if by pure computational power the AI makes a decision and no human could have ever made that decision because we lack the ability to do so, um, then we also have to think about, okay, where is the accountability now? Um, because it's technically something that we as humans don't even understand anymore. So I don't know, take chess bots, for example. They work in ways that humans cannot compute, compute anymore. That's why you lose against them. Yeah. And then it's the question, okay, who is accountable if an AI that goes beyond human ability makes a mistake? Because, I don't know, I think in that moment you have to hold the creator accountable. But it's also like a really... Can I, can I do my best to try and summarize yeah. this? Good Thank luck you. summarizing Thank you. that. <laughs> so, so the statement or the question being made is that when you have an AI of a computational power that makes it uncomprehensible for a human being to make any decisions about it, where do you put the accountability? Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think it's incomprehensible. Um, it's beyond our computational power. But chess is very simple. It's a very it, it's rule based. It's a very simple set of rules, very simple set of moves. It's just that when you start looking at um, it, it planned over time, it's sufficiently still computationally, um, you know, rich for for most for most of us. Um, but we understand the moves that are being done, we created the rules. Mm -hmm. um, and even though we may not have made that same move because we hadn't been able to see that many more moves ahead, uh, I, I think we're not completely lost in that. Uh, just to finish the, the point, um, so even if we don't quite understand how, what it's seeing that many steps ahead, um, we can allow it to do that because it really has very little significance. In other contexts where it really matters what the outcomes are, we need to be involved in that process. And that's just my, my opinion about it. But I, I don't see why we would want to relinquish that. I think we should be involved in that process and understanding that using the computational power to help us see things we could not ordinarily see, but then making decisions what we do with what we see. Okay, I'd love to keep this discussion going, but yeah, we do have to wrap right, up. Right. Uh, you can always find them after. So we're going to be moving forward to the rapid fire round. 
Uh, essentially, I'll be saying a statement and prepare your green and red cards because we're going to see how many people agree or disagree with the statements. Uh, all right, so let's just immediately kick it off uh, with the statement, ethics is programmable. Programmable. You can program ethics into an AI. All right. Um, followed. AI can't be stupid. It only does what it's programmed to. Humans are stupid. <laughs> if you could summarize your disagreement. Yeah, I think you can, you know, uh, you can say. Oh, microphone. You can take a problem that's very well understood, like chess, and you can build two automatic chess players. One of them is much more stupid than the other, uh, right? I mean, one of these uh, gamers plays worse than the other, even though both of them are based on the interviews with the same set of chess experts. So, so relative so to each other. The technicality of the system matters. We are talking about the systems as if they are these mysterious beings, but we know actually how they were built, and they could build the, they could be built better or worse. So you can translate it to stupidity. All right. Next statement: We are glorifying AI today. Okay. Uh, AI has a place in the military. <laughs> AI has a place in the military. <laughs> Fair? Uh, AI research should be supervised by an ethics board. That is a lot of green. Is there any red? Interesting. Uh, AI will eventually control large portions of society. So make political decisions, for example. In a way, it already does, yeah, with the media, for example. Uh, we have a question? Do we have a question? Uh, AIs will never be capable of true creativity. <laughs> rapid fire. It's rapid fire, Frank. We just have to kick on. <laughs> Raise the headache card. Um, upscaling neural network and deep learning architectures is a solution to stupid AI. So instead of trying to approach it in, in different ways, just try what we're trying harder. That's always a good idea. Try harder is a good idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, just like a car needs needs to have insurance, AI should also be insured to account for its potential mistakes. All right. Maybe in the future we'll have insurance brokers for AI agents. Yeah, it's entirely possible. All right. Well, uh, that wraps up the rapid fire round. I'd like to have a brief afterward before we depart. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'd like to thank all of you for the amazing discussion. Uh, please, everyone, a uh, round of applause for our speakers who are accompanying us here today. Um, also, I would like to ask for a round of applause for our uh, Enigma and Sulem Henelale to helping make this event. And our happen. amazing host, of course. Thank you very much. The unsung heroes. So, I hope you had a good time uh, listening to and considering critical implications of employing AI and that you will continue to do so in the future, especially throughout your studies. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Before you leave, we have a link. Uh, I know you all love scanning QR codes, so uh, I'd ver we'd very much appreciate it if you could scan this. It's an evaluation, uh, how much you enjoyed the event or what we can improve in the future. Uh, and feel free, we hope to see you for drinks. Um, my colleague Hannah has tickets for one free drink, so. If you're joining us for drinks at the Espanade, please come to her for your free drink ticket. You were an amazing audience. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.